This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB Public Media app. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's Fell to Rusty, and I am still buzzing from a talk I gave at the Startville Library yesterday. Java, it was incredible. Some of my former professors were there. Yeah, you, I can tell it was a good time because that was one of the first things you said to me. I just gave a big talk in Starkville, and the crowd really had me jazzed up, man. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of members, you know, a lot of, a whole lot of folks listen to Gestalt Gardener. Big shout out to them. Appreciate them supporting us during drive time, too. <clears throat> but uh, there's a lot of members of the Mississippi uh, Gardening Facebook page. There was just a whole bunch of folks who, you know, put in the newspaper and all that. But it was some of my professors there. And I got to tell the truth. <laughs> Things that you wanted to say way back in class, but well, you, you, you had know, a little too much respect for You know, them. I was I was raised by <laughs> older gardeners. My great grandmothers were horticulturists. I helped her with her daffodils up until I was ten years old. You know, my grandmothers were garden club ladies and all that stuff. And, you know, I was taught by people to spend a lifetime of figuring stuff out and and settling down to what works. You know, tired of experimenting. Here's what works. And so when I went to university, I found out, well, here's what you can try to do that doesn't work, but we'll figure ways to pull it off. Yeah, there you so, go. So, you know, it's a little little code. We were talking about code switching <laughs> before, you know. And uh, they didn't plant in soil. They planted in the dirt, you know, th- this kind of stuff. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. We had a whole bunch of fun. And um Looking forward to doing some more. I don't have anything coming up the next week or so, but looking forward to seeing folks all around the state. I got an email from somebody who wanted to know where you were. Where's Java? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I've been busy. I was out one week due to unforeseen circumstances. And then last week, we were actually on the road um, doing something with Visit Jackson. So um, it took me away from the studio. But I'm back. I'm back. I'm here today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, here. Ju- I'm just <laughs> letting you know. I'm letting you know, my friend, that, that when you are off doing other real work, people interfere in my personal space. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, good for us to both be back here. Hey, let's start. A, this is a call-in program. It's a, it's a live program, one of the rare things on National Public Radio. Here at MPB, we have locally produced programs. We have folks talking about local issues. And we're going to get dirty doing that, what we do best. We can start out right off the bat. Uh-oh, I see orange. There's an orange one. I'll go with the orange one, right? Go with the orange one. Jim in Jackson. Good morning, Jim. How are you? Good morning, Felder. Jim Rosenblatt here. Uh, I hope all is well with you on the rainy day. Oh, yeah. I, I went out and, uh, and and actually stood some stuff out where it could get some rain. I have a question about soil temperature. I understand that the soil needs to be a certain temperature. Is that true when you have to plant seeds that need to germinate, or is that also true when you're transplanting seedlings, that it needs to be a certain temperature. Well, it's a little bit of both. You know, some uh, summer t- plants that like warm weather, you know, zinnias and tomatoes and peppers, uh, the, their roots won't grow in cold weather. Matter of fact, they not only won't won't grow, uh, but they actually can rot and, and they have problems. A lot of people have skips in their rows, you know, people who plant like beans and they don't come up nice and even. It's a lot of times because, and they blame the bad seed. Cold, wet soil. So it, you know, temp- temperature is what starts German temperature and moisture start seed germination and also help or hinder roots. So, anyway, for summer stuff, everybody wants to plant. You know, last week because it was so nice and warm. But no, let's wait until the cold rains have passed, and that's usually in the south, our part of the south. Uh, planting summer stuff before April is almost always going to be a mistake. It's a gamble, but it's almost always going to stunt plants. Is there anything artificially you can do? For example, could you incorporate fresh manure into the soil to increase the soil temperature? Well, you could, but that has relatively minor effect. You know, one of the one of the best things to do is to row your garden up uh, to where it drains better and raise beds and in, in high rows drain better, but also they catch more sunshine. Is they become solar collectors? So little raised beds and uh, and and rows, uh, you know, not only help with the draining away the cold soil, but 
uh, that catches solar energy. That's the best. You know, and some people, you could put black plastic out on top of the ground and then plant and slits through that, you know, and they'll catch heat. But then in summertime, you got to cover those up because they get too hot. But, you know, black plastic will help warm it up. Raised beds, rows will help warm it up. But other than that, the, uh, the other thing is a lot of people mulch their gardens. I, I always say, and I learned this from a guy named Milo Burnham, Dr. Milo Burnham in Mississippi State. He said, wait until uh, towards the end of April before you mulch so that the sunshine can help warm the soil up because mulch will keep that from happening. Felder, I just got back from London, and you had mentioned daffodils a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's amazing to me that even though the temperatures over there were very cold and cool, the daffodils out there are all out already, just about the same time that ours are, where the temperatures are warmer. Yeah, so well, it must the, be something other than temperatures that drive no, the blooming of daffodils. No, no, yeah, yeah, no. Daffodils they they need cool weather. One of the reasons why we can't grow as many daffodils as they do further north and in England is because uh, it gets too hot too soon. So there are a lot of plants like lettuce, uh, daffodils that need cold temperature. They don't like hot temperature. You know, different seasonal plants. It was really nice to go to a place where I could speak the language. <laughs> well, they were talking about you behind your back. <laughs> Thank you, Felder. <laughs> okay, appreciate it. Okay, that was Jim Rosenblatt from Jackson. Let's go to Mobile, Louisiana. Louise, thank you for holding on. You called early on. What's going on? <laughs> you said Mobile, Louisiana. Oh, I did. Okay, Mobile, <laughs> <laughs> Alabama. Man, come on, Alabama. Uh, she said what we call I, East, Eastern L.A., Eastern Lower Alabama. I, my name is Louise in Alabama. That's enough to confuse you. I understand. Well, what's up? So now, I need to know. You you told us earlier in the year um, to start fertilizing the lawn in April. That's right. So a couple of days ago, I mowed those weeds. I mean, lots of weeds. I just mowed them down, mowed them high, just like you always tell us. Mm-hmm. And I have some 13, 13, 13 fertilizers from last year. I know you don't really approve of it, but is it okay to use it? It, well, it's, first of all, it's, it, and, and I, it's not my place to prove or not approve something, but I have to look at it from the science point of view, from the grass point of view. Triple 13 has got nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. Grass doesn't need much phosphorus, that middle number, and it can actually interfere with other stuff. So that's the main reason why not to use triple 13. Grass doesn't like phosphorus, which is that middle number. It likes that first number, nitrogen. The problem with triple 13 is that's ammonium nitrate, which is like cocaine in the plant world. It's fast, it's strong, it's temporary, and then it's gone. And grass likes a long, slow, steady feeding. So there's two reasons why triple 13 isn't ideal for lawns is you know if you're a farmer you know you want that fast rush and then they come back and they use just ammonium nitrate the rest of the year but for the lawn is better to go ahead from the grass's point of view to use one of these uh, lawn fertilizers that's got a long slow type of feeding nitrogen all season long and here's the trick it's expensive because they sell it the maximum they can get away with when they say this bag covers so many thousand square feet that's the most you can put out. You can make that bag go twice as far, which means it costs half as much, and the grass will be so much better off than using an agriculture, fast, instant result, gone type of fertilizer. So, you know, okay. I, 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 I do not have a problem with triple 13 or ammonium nitrate, but grass does. Okay. Give me the number for the for the good uh, fertilizer that I should use, and it, then I have another question. It'll just have, it'll say lawn food. The first number will be high, very low second number, and the third number will be uh, medium to high. But if it says lawn for lawns, have you got St. Augustine grass? Yes. Okay. It, I yes. would use this stuff, go to a garden center, get this stuff they call centipede food. First and third number are the same, zero middle number. Centipede food uh, is great for centipede in St. Augustine, but otherwise just get anything that's just lawn fertilizer without any gimmicks. No weed and feed, no herbicide, you know, just plain old lawn fertilizer and make the bag go twice as far as it says it go. Your grass will thank you. Okay. Now with the... <laughs> With the existing, I'm a war baby. I, I was born before World War II, and I, I hate to throw anything away. So 
Is it better to throw my 13, 13, 13 away? No, no, no. Put, put, it no put, it, put it around your shrubs and stuff. Oh, okay. Or in the backyard where nobody sees it. Well, Is not, that okay? Not, I, I wouldn't put it. It's, it's a good fertilizer. It's just not a good lawn fertilizer. Lawns are, you know, we have to, just like dogs and fish, you feed them different things. Okay. And the laws but, but, don't like ammonium nitrate and phosphorus, so it's triple thirteen is just not a good lawn fertilizer. That's all I'm saying. But you can use it around trees yeah. and shrubs and flower beds and oh. all that stuff. Okay, now uh, the somebody in the neighborhood put some stuff on his kind of. It looks like a, a, a map. You know, it's kind of the shape of it is not round it's just kind of odd and it seems like he put that stuff on where the weeds were the worst or something and it looks black almost i mean dark 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 brown just looks black and you put that on his lawn what do you think that was no idea <laughs> no idea okay and i have some more cotton seed Meal. Yeah, that's that's good. See, and see, that's that's a nice, long, slow-acting type of, uh, and it's a natural source of nitrogen. But it's a, it's good. It, it'd be good for the lawn too. It takes fifteen pounds to a thousand square feet. Okay. All right. Is it too soon if I start putting it down next week, a little early for? You mm. know, I. I recommend I recommend based on turf science and research done across the southeast from Texas to Florida to the Carolinas, I recommend waiting till around the first of April. And I'm sticking okay. with that because that's what we've shown is best for the if you fertilize and fo- other folks are listening, let me throw out why. If you fertilize grass early, it greens up and it looks great. But what happens is when grass first starts to green up in the spring, if you fertilize it then, it kicks out a lot of green growth, but it stops the rooting. And so the grass doesn't get off to a good start. And a month later, you got a great-looking lawn with not many roots. So let's wait till the grass is greened up. It's called spring transition uh, in turf world. Let's wait till it's greened up, been mowed a couple of times, the ground is warm, then fertilize. And, you know, or, or do whatever you want to do, but... I'm sticking with what I know. Not, oh, not, I, not, not, yeah, not my, not my opinion. Auburn says this. So, you know, it, I, I, I'm just sticking with that. I, I stick with what you tell me. I will wait till April. And I remember you talking about the root system not being very strong yeah. if, if it's too right. early and too cold. Okay, so we got, yeah. this, we got this one worked out, Louise yeah. from yeah. Mobile. Well, we appreciate you, Cahol. That's some good questions there, Java. Good question. And we have some more lined up. Yep. Go up to South Haven, Mississippi. Rebecca, thank you for holding. How are you today? Good morning, Felder. Appreciate you being there. You bet. What's up? Well, I am, honest to goodness, asking for a friend because I only have (laughs) one rose bush. And it's my one rose bush is amazing. We bought it at Kmart back when there was a Kmart for $3.50. And it's. Yeah, it's had black spot, but it just keeps coming back, so mm-hmm. we just love it. But I've got a friend that has got a very small landscaping side business, and mm-hmm. um, one of the yards, she planted a whole row of knockout roses, and they were beautiful, and they all got Rosetta. Yep. And she pulled them all out, and she's getting differing opinions on whether to put more roses there. Should she never put more roses there? Should she put them right back in, or okay? What, these these, what these are good. These are good questions. But again, like with the four, uh, the other caller, I'm, forget opinions. Here's the facts: Rosette is a virus that spread mechanically from plant to plant, which means, and once a plant gets infected, it spreads throughout the whole plant. There's no way to get it out. Is no cure for it. But it's spread from plant to plant, usually by little insects, aphids and thrips and other little insects that, that, that move from infected plants to non-infected plants, and they, they spread sort of like the, the entomological version of dirty needles. You, know, you can also spread it from plant to plant with pruning shears. If you snip a plant that's infected and move right to the next plant, there's just enough sap on there to infect the new plant. So insects and pruning shears are the two main ways where they spread. So once you get rid of them, if, the, if you give it a little bit of time until the insects that fell off have either died or moved on or something like that, then you can go, go ahead and plant back in the same area. 
So, like as you plant roses or, or yeah, I'm, I'm, roses I'm just saying the, 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 to it or? The, the vector is gone. The thing that spreads the disease is no longer there. If you dig them up and immediately replant, you know, there's a good chance that aphids and thrips and stuff like that that fell off the infected plants are still hanging around and get on the new plants. But if, uh, you know, if she waits a little while, you know, a few months or something to replant roses, that, that normally that would be fine. But um, it, 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 but roses aren't the only plant out there. We have so many good plants besides knockout roses. So many. What I, I would, knew you'd say that. <laughs> it's true. I, I'm I'm saying that because it's true. A lot of people insist on doing what they want to do, and sometimes it's not practical. And so we drop back to Plan B. But in, anyway, if she wants to replant, if it's been uh, you know a, a couple of three or four months since there are roses there, probably not a problem replanting there. Okay. What other plants would you recommend? I, I, I've written books and books and books on that. There's just so many. Go- okay. I t- t- y'all go out to go to Dixon uh, Gallery and across the street to the Botanical Garden there in Memphis and look at all the stuff they got. There's so many good good plants. Roses are great. I love roses, but they're mm-hmm. they're you know when you plant them in a row, you're asking for trouble. Okay. Now I've got a second question for you. Different topic here got a, another friend that had a, asparagus last year was her third year this is her fourth year and nothing's coming up and she's wondering it's, it's, give it a couple it's, more weeks or yeah it's, 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 ruined it's, or? it's just beginning to come up it's just beginning to come up the further north you go the better asparagus grows but it grows fine you know in 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 north and central uh south it'll even grow along the gulf coast but uh, it's just now starting to come up usually i think late march april Okay. All right. To All right. Well, you know, let's just wait and see. And uh, what I would also okay. recommend is have your friend plant some daffodils there this fall so you got something to look at while you're waiting for the asparagus. There's no reason you can't plant uh, uh, daffodils in with asparagus. Well, that's what I did, and I'm really enjoying my daffodils. Good, 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 I just good. planted my asparagus last fall and put daffodils with them, and I'm good. really enjoying the daffodils. Well, all righty, lady. Well, we're going to move on. Have Thank a good. So we Phil. appreciate it. Thank you. Now, Felder, before we go to our good friend Francis in Natchez, I just want to let everybody know that the podcast of this episode is brought to you by the Varicosity Vein Center. And for more information about the Varicosity Vein Center, you can visit varicosityveincenter.com. We really appreciate all of our sponsors. Uh, and before we go to this next call, let me mention what I call pub talk because I always hear all sorts of stuff at the pub. Here's a classic thing. Uh, Felder, let me ask you. I know you aren't working, but <laughs> what? Th- th- that's the way it always starts. What are those things that come up right now and you have to pull them up? Wait. <laughs> that was my question. Oh. What are those things? You, I know you're not working, but put your beer down and tell me what's that coming up right now that you're supposed to pull up? No and description. I'm thinking, I, I, I said, I said, your pants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, sorry about that. Let's go to uh, Francis in Natchez. Hey, Francis, good morning, sir. Hey, fella. Thanks up? for having me on. Sure, what's up? I got three questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. First one is, uh, three questions, one comment. Question uh, one is, uh, I, look, I made you aware of uh, eating gardenia leaves, you know, flower leaves. Uh, my gardenias... The uh, leaves, some of them are turning yellow and falling off. Yeah. Why? Right. Next no. question. Okay. I've asked you this before. Uh, the sago palm. Uh, it's a lot of babies around the plant. How do you go transplant them to another area? Third, uh, if a fruit tree blooms, does it necessarily mean that you're going to get fruit? And the comment is, I remember this guy in the neighborhood, and uh, people didn't like him. Just before the rain, they would throw fertilizer out all over his yard. Oh, and he no. was wondering why he was cutting his grass so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's guerrilla gardening. Uh, the answer your question is, I've already forgotten the first one. First one, my gardenia. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, a gardenia leaves is an older leaf shed, which they do, just like magnolia. They put on new leaves, the old leaves fall off. Gardenia leaves turn bright yellow before they shed. That's normal. So next question. Uh, the sago palm. 
Uh, yeah, just just twist them up. Once, but I forgot. Put on some gloves because they got sharp little things, and it's hard to explain. But it's like it's like needles sticking out of them. Put on some gloves and grab on it, and just give it a good twist, and just sort of like you're unscrewing a light bulb until it comes out and it's to get some dirt. Okay. And, and the, the fruit tree. Place. Okay, a f- just because a fruit tree blooms doesn't mean it's going to have fruit. Because some you have, uh, they they don't pollinate themselves. They need pollen from a nearby. Related variety. In other words, two apple trees, most apples won't produce by themselves. You put two different kinds out there and they cross pollinate, they'll make apples. Uh, so you have to have bees to pollinate them. And in a lot of cases, depending on the fruit, you need two different varieties nearby. Not, it's not always true, but like there's some pears pollinate themselves, some won't. So you need bees and need pollen. So it okay, depends. but you know, I got the bees because I got a, a lot of wild plum trees around the yard. Yeah, but see, but, a, pl- a plum tree won't pollinate a pear tree. Okay, well, this is, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, oh boy, I can't think of the name of this stuff. Uh, oh boy, a mayhaw tree. Yeah, and may- when I bought the tree, the guy said that it was a, uh, well, the company said that it was self pollinate. Yeah, right. It is. Yeah, uh, but 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 they will always have better fruit. It's like blueberries. One blueberry bush will have blueberries if it gets pollinated by bees. But if you have two different varieties, they will both have more fruit. But anyway, no, may may is a native plant. They're self fertile, but they just have to have bees to diddle the flowers. Mm-hmm. Okay, man, we got a scoop. You got some okay. good good questions in uh, your in, uh, in as far as neighbors. What I would do is I would throw clover seed out there too. See you, man. Bye. <laughs> okay, Java. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't know. You said it. That's right. <laughs> we got a little strip up and down State Street in Jackson, where I live, between a curb and the sidewalks. It's like a little foot and a half strip of clay, and I plant all sorts of stuff out there. Nobody knows it but me. <laughs> <laughs> so don't tell anybody. Of course. Okay, let's go down to Mobile. Gene, thank you for holding. What's going on? Hey, much to it. I'm trying to hear. Can you hear me without this machine running next door blowing the leaves? Yeah, the it's, it's fine. It's fine. If it's you, take your finger off the trigger. All right. Uh, listen, I've got a window that faces due east on my house, and uh, I've got a uh, little uh, baker's rack that I had inherited. Right. And I used it during the Christmas time to put amaryllis on it. It did beautifully in there, so I took those out. And I want to plant some kind of plants in pots, and I'm thinking about planting some uh, some uh, sun patients in there. And it don't get direct sun; it's just bulk up something, tree leaves and stuff. Yeah. So so it don't get too hot. But does anything be better than the sun patients putting in there? Or, well, the, you know? the sun patients look great, but what they would look better is if you had created a little tropical scene. If you get some asparagus fern, you know what an airplane plant or spider plant is. Uh-huh. You know, they got those cascading things, you know, put one of those on one shell, put the some patients on a couple of three shells and, you know, and, you know, mix up some foliage plants, but asparagus fern. Have you, and, have you been talking to my wife? Nope. <laughs> is that her? In, is that her in the background? No, no, it's not her, but. She's always got all these ideas, playing all this stuff. I, it I works. It, well, see, see, it works. And that way, if one of your sun patients die, nobody can tell. Well, you know, I had a sun patient for several years. This last one, I got, my wife got sick and I couldn't take care of them. I yeah. used to root them. I root 200 of them. Yeah. So I, I got the first one this year. So. Well, so, you some the summertime, by any chance? Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they do fine. But some patients, you know, put you, you know, just mix a, some things up. Create a little scene there, a little tropical All thing. All right, man, you made my day. Okay, appreciate it, man. Go tell them to you call have, them. You have a good one. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, and let's go to... Lester in Germantown. What's up, Lester? Hey, how's it going? Good. So far, so good. What's up? First time calling. I uh, I bought some uh, tulip bulb. Uh huh. While back, but I never did get a chance to plant them. I was wondering, is it too late to plant them? I stay up like in close to Memphis area. Well, you know, if you go out to Dixon uh, Gallery, theirs are in full bloom right now. But anyway, you already got them. They're not going to save. You can't say, you know, if you ever try to save an onion or a garlic, they just sort of disappear or turn rot. So, the, the, you know, the, they're not going to they're not going to save. So you might as well. These aren't by any chance. Have they been in the refrigerator at all? No. Okay. Just hanging in the, the garage. Well, they I already kind of sprout now. 
Yeah, I'd go, I'd go ahead and plant them. You know, they're one-shot things anyway. You know, you get one flower out of each one of them, and that's it. They don't come back the next year. So what i do is I would put uh, some in pots here and there and then stick you some kind of flower in the middle of the pot so you got something to look at till the tulip blooms. When the tulip is gone, you still got a flower to look at. But I go ahead and plant They're not going to stay. You can't save them till fall. Right. Okay. All righty, okay. man. Thank you, a lot. you bet. Hey, Lester, appreciate you calling, man. Hey, I, and I want to ask oh. this. First time caller, how's it been? Was it okay? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I've been listening to you for a long. This is my first time uh, getting well, the nerve up to call you. Uh, well, listen, hey. do do us a favor. When, they, when, when it's all said and done, if they work, let me know. If they didn't work, let me know. But let's talk about okay. it later. Okay, then. Okay, Lester, yeah. appreciate it, man. Okay. Okay, we got before we go to the cheesy tune, let's go to Rizzlin and talk with Don. Don, what's up? Hey, Falcon, can you hear me? I'm in the rain. I'm sorry, driving. <laughs> it's a lot of rain. Yeah, I can hear you fine. What's going on? Great, thank you. Love your show. Um, I've got Bermuda grass in my yard, and I've got these green areas of look like a weed with petals or something on it grows close to the ground. I hate the way it looks because it just makes my Bermuda look hard. Yeah. How do I get rid of that? What is it, do you think? Well, it's it's like that pub thing. What's that coming up right now? What can I do about it? Without seeing it, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but let's just call it a weed, okay? And there's two kinds. There's grassy weeds, and they look like grasses. And so they can be really low growing, and there's broadleaf weeds. It got, you know, if it ain't a grass, it's called a broadleaf. And there are weed killers you can use on those that won't hurt Bermuda grass. So if you'll go to any garden center and get something that says for controlling dandelions or clover or something like that, that will control that little weed. But now it's getting a little bit late. You know, we're starting to see a little bit of grass greening up, but uh, the stuff that'll kill the clovers and the dandelions and all. It won't hurt Bermuda grass. It'll hurt St. Augustine. But uh, if you want to go ahead and get you a liquid spray, it'll be, it'll be pretty tomorrow. You know, let's do this as soon as you can. And don't stand there and just dose it. Just, you know, mix up a weed, these, one of these weed killers and just wet the leaves of these weeds. And within a few days, it'll start turning yellow. That's great, Willard. Uh, if I don't do anything, will the grass overtake it? Oh yeah, yeah, Bermuda grass. You, if you wait till 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 April, till next month, and give your grass, a you know, just go ahead and get a good lawn fertilizer, a not a garden for a lawn fertilizer. You put it out in April, then uh, Bermuda grass will overcome just about anything. And if you have a real big problem with it right now, you could spray next January on a nice warm day in January, early February. While those weeds are still small, they're easier to kill. So if you don't want weeds in your yard, if you don't see them as wildflowers. If you'll spray them in on a nice warm day or week in in uh, in the earlier in the winter before they get big, they're easier to control and they won't irritate you. Well, they just don't. We just don't think about it then. So you know, just put your note on the refrigerator to spray next January. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Oh, okay, one last thing. Just say no to weed and feed. Fertilize separate. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is based on turf sign. Fertilize in April, but use your weed killers separate. It's a whole lot better. Okay. Okay, hands hands on the wheel. You got more rain headed your way. I pulled over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, appreciate it, Don. Thanks. All righty. Job, it's been kind of crazy. Yeah, we've been rocking and rolling. Hey, we wh- do have over phone lines, though. <laughs> Java, uh, uh, MPB. We got we got we got medical stuff. We got travel. We got Mister Fix It. We got the foodies. We've got the garden. How come they ain't a a, a, local, a a weekly music thing? There are Saturday nights are made for music right oh. here at MPB. <laughs> Felder, what are you doing, man? I'm, I'm just that was a softball. <laughs> that was a softball. And is it available on podcast also? Yes, yes. Okay. From five p.m. to well past midnight on Saturday nights, you can get your music fix from. All genres. When I say all, I mean all. Well, we just want to let you know, you know, those of you who <laughs> like the laid back Hugh Masakala tune or the more upbeat Friends of Distinction from the 60s or you like the original Mr. Bull number four, we're here for you. But let's talk about gardening now. Back to garden. We got a couple of callers on the line. We're going to start in Covington, Louisiana, talking with Polly. Polly, thank you for holding on. What's going on? 
Hey, Felder, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, is it too late to sow grass seeds? It's just, just now beginning to be the time. Okay, good, good, good. Wait, 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 and, wait. What kind of grass seed are you talking about? Well, this is a problem. I don't know what I have. <laughs> okay. I think I know it's not Zoysia, and I know it's not Bermuda. Well, it's going to be um, either Centipede or St. Augustine. St. Augustine doesn't... Not- it doesn't come from seeds, so your choice is going to be centipede. Okay, and that I, I figured that I figured that yeah. uh, St. Augustine would. Um, okay, so I, I can just throw it out there. Well, he, I would I would wait a little bit longer. The soil, oh. it, our very first caller today, uh, 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 f- I'm drawing a total blank, Rosenblatt. Oh, bit, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Our first caller was talking about soil temperature. Uh, centipede sea won't sprout till the ground gets warm. And down in south, south uh, you know, that close to the coast, latter part of this month. But here's the trick. S- seed has got to be in contact with the dirt, not just caught up in a bunch of weeds. It needs to be on the dirt to do well. And it takes centipede seed almost a month just to sprout. Once it sprouts, it's great, but you need to be prepared to wet the area down, not water it, but just wet the seeds down uh, every couple of three days for nearly a month until it sprouts. Because if we have a hot, dry spell uh, and they're just cracking open, they can die. So a little bit of water, just wet the area down every couple of three days till it sprouts. And if you wait till closer to April, the seed will sprout quicker. Okay, good, 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 good. That's what I needed to know. I love your show. I wouldn't miss it. I pray, hey, it might have been more than you wanted to know, but it's what you needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your call, Polly. See you later. Okay, and let's slide up to Neshoba County. Bill, wild man Bill. What's going on, guy? Uh, I just wanted to start off by saying how much I liked your presentation at the Stark Row Library. That was it was a it was an interesting group, and I got bold. I was saying some things you probably couldn't say, three hundred yards to the to the east on campus. <laughs> so well, I won't tell if you won't tell. There you go. So what's up? I did have fun. What's up? Okay, okay. I have four pass along iris beds, mm-hmm. and uh, I only had time over the winter to cut one of them back uh-huh. and the other other three are they're all coming up but i can see that there's little brown spots on them so have i doomed them to failure or uh, what know, should i do i don't i don't know i don't know what the brown spots are there is a as a fungus is called rust that gets on them sometime and there's some fungal leaf right. spots but i i don't know what the i don't know what the, so is a new growth coming out with spots on it or is it last year's growth can you uh, tell? Hard to tell. Yeah. Hard to tell. I think it's last year's growth. Yeah, if it's last oh, year's, sure. the new growth should come up nice and clean. Uh, you know, and it's going to be a decent day tomorrow, you know, or the next day. If you could get out there and just, uh, is it, uh, are, these bi- are these big beds? Are we talking about a lot of irises? Well, uh, you, you add all three of them together, it does turn up to be a lot. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, you don't have to really do much with irises. The new growth will come up fine. And it'd be nice and clean. If it's got a disease on it, uh, sometime this summer, I would just leave them alone if you can. You know, maybe snip off a few bad-looking leaves now, but just leave them alone. And sometime over the summertime, uh, let's find out for sure what the problem is. You you can take uh, some of those leaves to the county extension office, uh, you know, there in Philadelphia, and they can send them off for free to the plant pathology lab, and they'll say it's a bacteria, it's a fungus. What if we find out for sure what it is, we can keep it from happening next year. But it's not going to kill your irises; it just boogers them up a little bit. Okay, uh, I'll I'll try that. Wait until later and take it to the. County Extension Office. Yeah, and uh, and then and let me know because I'm always curious about stuff like this. But the main thing is is that you don't have to do irises grow in cemeteries. Dead people can grow irises, and a lot of times they don't look good up close. It's sort of like me, you know. If, across the, you know, if, if you sit back in the back, I'm okay. You get up close, I got a boogered up nose. Same thing with your irises. We're okay. <laughs> Well, thank you. Okay. But, hey, let me ask you this. Was this the first time you've been to one of my, my lectures? 
Uh, yeah, I've been to several. Okay, so you know it's the same old stuff. I'm a, I, I just get up and dance and prance around. I'm a, somebody called me the Rolling Stones of cucumbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, you make me happy. Good, so good, I'm good, glad good. To listen to you. It's all about guarding, man. I appreciate your call, Bill. Thank you. And now, answers to unasked questions from Felder <laughs> Rushing. That's right. Somebody asked me, and I said unasked question, but they actually asked this one. What causes spring fever? Ah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. And f- come to find out, and, and I'm, I'm not a medical guy. You know, y'all can run this by the medical programs. But in general, in the fall, the days start getting shorter. Uh, they start losing a little color. And our 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 pineal gland, tiny little gland about the size of a grain of rice, it stops. It starts pumping out this this stuff. And it's caused by, get this, suprachiasmatic nucleus. <laughs> it regulates how much light gets to our brain. Anyway, it it starts pumping out this stuff that that covers up uh, our excitement. It makes us slow down. We put on an extra layer of fat because it's about to get cold. We get slow and almost dull. Middle of the winter, it gets so bad we get depressed. They call it seasonal affective disorder. You know the winter blues because the l- low level of light is masking this stuff that makes us feel good. But in the spring, when the days start getting a little bit longer, we get more light, there's more color coming in, then this masking stuff disappears, and it starts producing stuff called melatonin, which gets us all excited, makes us want to get up and go. And same thing with, 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 with other other mammals. You know, so it's the amount of light and the color. Then in the fall, we lose the ability to appreciate it. We slow down for winter and then lengthening days and color start making us feel good again. And it's all about hormones. You researched that one. I did. Well, you know, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Because it's a good question. I've actually written about this, you know, spring fever versus winter blues and all. And that's the reason I say everybody needs a bottle tree in their yard. You put glass bottles on a stick out in your yard in the middle of the winter, you got color. It keeps you from getting the winter blues. You stave off the winter blues. So, anyway. <laughs> now, Felder, we're coming up toward the end of the show. We still got a few people trying to sneak in. But, but if you're just joining the program, um, you need to know that you can listen back uh, via podcast, which is sponsored by Varicosity Vein Center. And for more information, you can visit varicosityveincenter.com. We appreciate them for um, helping us out with the podcast, which is available wherever you get your audio. All righty. Well, we're going now to, it says... Eight Mile, Alabama, is, and it's Clarence. Clarence, is that the name of your town, or are you eight miles into Alabama? No, that's the name of my town. The name of your town, is it spelled eight, E-I-G-H-T, or is it the number eight? Uh, either way, eight, the number or spelling, <laughs> uh, it'll work either way. Okay, well, you know, i got to come there. Where is eight, Alabama? It does, it's right it's, outside of... Uh, uh, Pritchett and Mobile. Okay. In Mobile oh. County. Okay. Okay. They got to get. Can I get some tamales there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll see you there. Yeah. Anyway, what you got going on in your yard? Well, I have a problem with some weeds and and stuff, and I was about to put out some fertilizer, but I heard you. I caught the last tail of it. Well, you were saying wait till April. Yeah. Fertilize. Yeah. And I've I got a problem with some weeds and stuff, and I'm going to put out some Scott turf field to weed and feed. Okay. okay. Weed. So we, on, right? uh, okay. Here's the thing. Weed and feed, the ingredients are okay, just like sugar is good and toothpaste is good, but you don't have sugary, cherry-flavored toothpaste. It's a bad combination of otherwise good ingredients. Uh, you need to wait till the grass is greened up and been mowed a couple of times, the new growth, which is around end of March, 1st of April, before you fertilize. Weeds are easier to kill when they're small and actively growing, and what will kill those weeds now can damage your centipede as it's starting to green up. So it's a whole lot better just the rest of this year just to mow what grows, fertilize in, in April, brace your more a little bit, and if you have a bunch of weeds, this 
time of year and they're bothering you, make a note to spray them with a liquid herbicide next January or February. Why, they're small. They're little. They're easy to control, and it's not as likely to damage your grass. So herbicides is chemotherapy. You can kill your patient by treating the symptoms too strongly. So a little bit late for spraying for weeds, a little bit early for fertilizer. So wait to fertilize. Make a note on the refrigerator to spray them next January or February. That's the best advice anybody can give you. The weeds in, in January? Yeah, because they're small. Those things are out there right now. If you go out there in, in wintertime, which I've done, they're there. They're just little. They don't bother us, but they're so easy to control then. Right now, they're bigger. They're sending energy up into to, to flowers and all. The energy's going up. Weed killers work better when the plants are small and sending food from their leaves down. So a whole lot easier, a whole lot more effective to, to spray in January or early February than it is right now. Plus, you can damage your grass if you spray right now. This, this is ter- They teach this at Auburn and Mississippi State and one, LSU and University of Georgia. Okay. i got one last question. This weed, it, it looks like a clover leaf, but it has purple around it. And it's trying to, it tried to take over my yard, and it just increases. Yeah. It comes in a little clump like Yeah, yeah. And it's got purple edges around it. Yeah. And it just... Drive me nuts. Yeah, does it ever have little flowers on it? Yeah. And and I, and they got little butterflies and pollinators and bees and stuff like that on it. That's that's a good thing. It bothers you, but here's the deal: what will kill that stuff if you spray it right now will kill your grass. So I would just mow it grows, and then if you if they're bothering you this year, try to control them a little bit earlier next year while they're easy to control. Hard to kill them right now okay. with herbicides. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Good luck. Right, good program. Thank you. All right. Claire, Clarence, live from 8 Mile, Alabama. Now, that's a new one. Eight Mile. I know out in Detroit because the rapper Eminem had a movie called 8 Mile. Yeah. But I didn't know it was an 8 Mile, Alabama. <laughs> Let's see if we get to Melanie in Memphis. Hey, Melanie. Good morning. Melanie. Uh oh. I don't think we're going to get to Melanie in Memphis or Teresa and Brandon. It's been rock and rolling type of show, man. It has. It happens. Yeah, it it does. It does. (laughs) And uh, and we took up a lot of time with music today. Well, sometimes we need to take up a lot of time yeah, with grazing music. grazing the grass, grazing the grass, having a good time. A lot of rain this today, but it's going to be pretty tomorrow. Got a whole lot of stuff going on. Hey, if you get a chance when you're in Jackson, go by the Agriculture Museum. It's off of Lakeland Drive uh, near Interstate 55. And look at the herb garden there, the doctor's herb garden that the master gardeners have been taking care of. It's looking good. And uh, if you have a chance to take a kid to a farmer's market or to a garden center, get them a pot some potting soil, handful of flowers, and uh, especially some culinary herbs. Nothing like teaching a kid how to grow oregano and parsley and thyme and rosemary, and they can have ownership in their meals by helping cook spaghetti and chili and pizza and stuff. Teach a kid through their senses. We're going to take a break. We call it a week. We'll be back next time. Teresa, Melanie, Hope you get a chance to call back then uh, or email me, felderrushing.blog, or uh, it doesn't matter. Just take your time. Breathe in, breathe out, and go out and get dirty. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. 